volume that I teach uh, psychology here at Berkeley. And my presentation today is about the, the mind of a terrorist. So before I get started, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the division that I'm in. We're in the social science division. Social science division, as you can read, refers to the academic discipline concerned with society. And you see all the different uh, disciplines up here. Political science, you know, as uh, as government. Going through my legs. Here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as government, what we actually do is we study how people do the things they do. I know when you sign up for classes, a lot of you are doing the core curriculum, and you're only taking certain classes to meet the core, which is great. But you can also take a lot of other uh, levels. If you're interested in uh, human behavior, then these are some of the classes you can take. I'm not going to give you another advertisement here, for example. <laughs> if you're on YouTube, you have six seconds, right, to listen to this ad and you can skip it. Right now, you're with me. These are some other classes that you could take in psychology, okay, if you're interested. Most of these classes are interactive classes, uh, excellent professors, uh, where you get to know more about one yourself and also the theories. What I try to do with what my colleagues do in a lot of these classes, and today as well, is I want to give you the theories okay, of psychology, but I also want to apply it. And I want to see that you can put this into practice in your lives, and that's what we do in psychology as well. All right, so let me get started. What I want to do today is I have a couple objectives for you. As I go through this, my slides are set up so that you're not going to be able to take notes on every single slide, okay? And uh, in my classes, I do that. I'm going to be going through this quite quickly. But one of the things you might want to think about as I go through this is, one, can you define terrorism? Two, let's discuss the importance of how people may change their perception. Because that's basically what this presentation is about, is that how does someone, are you ready, like you, and I really mean like you, can turn around and maybe put some bombs on your chest and go and blow something up or to kill some other people? So how do we change perceptions of people like that? And then the last thing was, let me show you what the process is that people go through before they get to this term terrorist. Now the application for all of you is going to be asking yourself some of these questions. Some of you are doing this for extra credit. Some of you came here uh, because you wanted food. Food's all gone. <laughs> some of you are here just out of interest. But uh, if you want to learn something from this, or take away uh, from this lecture, this information, I want you to think about these questions. Can someone be persuaded to kill others? Okay, it's a now. Okay? And some people would think the word shouldn't be kill others. Maybe we need to get rid of some certain people that are in the world. Now, I'm not saying that, but certain people may have perceptions that way. Yeah. Can this perceptual persuasion happen to you or someone close to you? Next one, does the process of perceptual conversion happen in other groups? As I talk about this today, I'll be talking about it mainly from having to become terrorists and what goes on in the mind of someone that makes them do this. But I think as I go through this, you might also look at other organizations, okay, groups that you may be in, that may persuade people to change some of their main views and values that we might have in this country as well. Not that you're going to get to the last level of action and actually destroy something or somebody, but can you get people to persuade them to change some of their views and opinions? And then what policies could be developed to deter the development of terrorists? All right, so let's start off by saying that there are so many different definitions so many different definitions uh, for terrorism. If you go on the internet, you can find many different ones. I'm just going to pick this one out from the FBI. Terrorism is defined in the Code of Federal Regulations as the unlawful use of force and violence against persons or property to intimidate, coerce, government, the civilian population to any other segment that that's there. I am not talking about the shooters who go into, let's say, Columbine or in Connecticut or just this last week at the 
Los Angeles uh, airport or the film in Chicago in the mall. Those people are completely different. We do a whole session on them because most of them have some kind of pathological illness that, that's there. These are the people we're talking about, about don't have a particular pathology. Right? Completely different. Terrorism. Some of you have these clickers. Some of you don't. You picked it up. What I'm going to do is give you a series of different questions. And if you want to interact with me, select what you feel the answers are. This one is a question for people who do have these. Would be, what do you think? Can someone be persuaded uh, to kill others? Okay. Simple question. Okay. If you think it's, yes, I strongly agree, you press 1. If it's, I just agree, it's 2. There is neutral, four is disagree, five is strongly disagree. Now, some of you were playing with these before you came in. Everybody give somebody something, they push buttons. And yours may not be working if you're pushing push buttons. So sorry about that. Okay, but if you have one, you can select the answer, and we'll show you what the majority of people think. Okay? So most of you, oh good, that's why you're here, right? So most of you, 82, 84% of you, 82% uh, of you say yes, you can. That's a pretty big statement you're all working using, that you can actually persuade someone to kill someone. Well, that's the purpose of this talk, it's here. It's interesting to know that you should believe that. All right, how do you percent persuade somebody? Well, it's all about perception, right? How do we know what's true and real? How do we know what's true and real? Those of you who took psychology, it's one of the first things we talk about is how do you perceive the world? All right, so what do you see up there? This is an illusion. What do you see up there? You see, you see a dragon, a woman, you see a tree that's up there. Some of you may not see any of that. Okay? Your perceptions are based on many different elements, which I'm about ready to describe. What do you see in this one? An old man, an old woman. Two people. What do you see? A guitar. Two older individuals. Two figures that are here, a younger woman, an older man playing a guitar. He's probably got a vision of what she used to look like. Oh. <laughs> she probably has a bottle of tequila that's over there saying that. I thought he used to look pretty bad too. Some people see that there's a hourglass here with faces within the hourglass. See that? Faces in the If you can't, okay, and this is a classic one, that you see two different pictures that are here, or perceive two different pictures. Basically, one, you have a chalice that's here. This is the, the top of it, come down to the stem. This is the base, come back up the other side. And then there are two faces that are looking at each other, right? You see a forehead here. There's a little cute little nose that's here. Oh, those are cute little lips. And there, and there's the chin. A little different lips here, a little larger lips there, a little higher uh, nose that's here. All right, so you can see that, right? Do uh, you see that there's actually a male and a female there? Yeah. How many people can see the male and the female? Sure. Right, most of us can. Can you all see that now? Can we go back over here and see maybe the hourglass here? And actually this nose, comes part, its arm or nose becomes part of someone's face, the chin line that's there in the background. Can you see that too? Oh, good. But guess what? Uh, no, there's no male and female there whatsoever. All this is, is the same face folded over like this. And that's all it is. Why did you perceive it that way? Don't answer that. Okay? But basically what, what's going on is that sometimes it's very easy to persuade people. Now, I'm not asking you to go kill somebody, right? I'm just asking you to change your perception of what's going on. But these people do a lot of times, they get a hold of you, okay? and I'll show you the process that's there. But one of the things they're going to do is have some convincing figure in authority tell you how to proceed. Now, after today, you may not think I'm convincing, okay? I'm lying to you now. And then they may also have people in the audience okay, who may say, oh, yeah, I see that. 
And then when other people begin to see that, they conform to the majority of the view. And before you know it, you change your perception. And you really see things that are not there. So perception is based on what? Biocycle social interactions. There's brain formation, the way your brain works to perceive the world, conditioned thinking, environmental influences. If you're going to change someone's perception, the first thing you're going to do is get a hold of the environmental influences. Okay? Make sure you're feeding them as much information as possible. Then what you're going to do is you're going to condition their thinking by running them through a series of exercises, plans, discussions, over and over and over again. But what most people don't realize is that when you do that over and over and over again, your brain actually changes. Okay? The formations in your brain change. When you think of something a certain way over and over again, it actually changes. So if I can get you or anybody else to change your perception, your brain will go along with that. So what you think is real based on your brain may not be real because you've been influenced in an incorrect way. But there's no way Okay, absolutely no way would you say no, your thinking or your perception is incorrect. Because the brain okay, will make sure that you do not change it. Your brain loves consistencies. It doesn't like to see any change. Most prejudice is based on stereotypical thinking. Okay? Learn from when you're very, very young, environmental influences, your parents, society, cultures condition you to think that way, you hear it over and over and over again, and your brain actually picks that up. So you will say, these people, and you can fill in the blank, whatever those people are, are this way. And every time you look at those people, okay, your brain wants to keep the world as consistent as possible, so it will view those people through your conditioned thinking and environmental influences without you even thinking about it. And it takes some work to try to change all of that. <coughs> Let's talk about perception a little bit more now. You've heard this statement, often repeated statement, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, which really reflects, reflects genuine doubt about what constitutes terrorism. And we can have an interesting discussion if we wanted to, to talk about the founding fathers and the original Tea Party people, not the Republicans now, who went to the Tea Party, were they terrorists? Well, you say no, they were freedom fighters. They founded our country, right? Well, I'm sure the British probably didn't think that, right? Because they fought against them to embarrass what they would call terrorist acts. What is this all about in terms of psychology? We call this social cognition. Right? All people operate on their own internal map of reality. And that map of reality may not be based on reality itself. Right now, every single one of you is sitting in this class having a different perception of what's going on. Your environmental, different, environmental influences are different. Your conditional thinking is different. Each one of you have a slightly different perception of what's going on. When we look at perception, and we look at the topic of terrorism, we can say, how could those people put bombs on them and then go in and blow up innocent people and children and destroy buildings? I would say that they were suicidal bombs. But there are other people right, who may have a different perception. They would say when they did that that they are martyrs. I would say, God, how can they do that? They may be crazed sociopaths. They may say, no, they're not. They're holy warriors. I might say, call them terrorists. They may claim that, no, they're freedom fighters. It's all about perception. So what is real and true? Right? Someone who's going to blow themselves up? I would say people who commit suicide, you know, they feel hopelessness and probably depression. Right? Learn helplessness. That's there. But if you think of yourself as a martyr, your perception changes. No, you're not helpless. You are hopeful, and you're hopeful about the afterlife. I would say people who are suicidal, have, they're trying to end intense and unbearable pain. 
someone who's going to strap arms around them and call themselves a martyr would say, no, they're going to further the cause. What they're doing is a heroic sacrifice for themselves. Others, like the general society, would say, no. Uh, others consider suicide undesirable. Most of us consider that in this culture. Otherwise, other people in that martyrdom phase that say would say, no, those people are considering a it's considered a heroic act there. Others of us, if you find someone who's suicidal, we usually attempt to discourage that behavior and feel guilty or ashamed if it does occur. Well, the other side says no, others encourage the behavior for family pride and they may also get social and financial support from that happens. Different perceptions, different perceptions. So what do you think? Can you drastically change someone's perception? And I recognize that leading into things is always different. By the way, your perceptions get changed all the time. We're talking about terrorists. It's called advertising, right? Advertising tries to do this to you all the time. All right, so the majority of you say, are saying yes, you can change it. How can a person change perception so drastically? Why did this man, who he had made, do this? Oklahoma City bombing. We're just dealing with the bombings in the United States right now. How did these, these people, okay? How about the way these people don't usually fit, fit the usual profile? Most of these people were well-educated, uh, college-educated, middle-class, upper-middle-class uh, individuals. And how did they do this? How did these two guys recently, right, just this year in Boston, do that? Now, one of the reasons why I've been interested in this is, as a therapist over the years, also a therapist over the years, um, I deal with abusive relationships and dysfunctional families. And the process that's used for those families to go wrong okay, is similar to the process that's used in changing people's perceptions. So I've always been very interested in that. And then my daughter lives in Boston, and she was in this building, right about over there when all this occurred. So she calls me and tells me what's going on. All cell phones went out. We lost it for a while. Comes back on again. And then she was told she couldn't leave her apartment for three days, which was wrong because it was part of the crime scene. So during that time, I sat there and talked with her, answering the question like most of us have when events like this happen. Why? Why did it happen? How did those people do that? So I'm on the phone with her and on Skype trying to talk with her and all the people in her building trying to answer those questions. So what do I do then as a social scientist? I'm going to go study this. I'm going to do as much research as I can to try to figure out why does this really happen. So the first thing we want to do is show you a little um, excerpt of an interview with uh, a fellow who got caught before he became a suicide Behind these high walls of Pulajaki prison, among the 7,000 inmates, are several men who say they're hell-bent on being terrorists. We've come here to meet a confessed would-be suicide bomber, one of hundreds now locked up behind bars. 25-year-old Rahala believes he was carrying out God's will when he and his friends planned an attack on American soldiers in Nangahal province. He says he agreed to wear a suicide vest and kill as many foreigners as possible. It's a special feeling that comes to you when you are ready for a suicide attack, he tells me. No one can stop you. No one could stop me. That is, except the law. When police arrested him five months ago in Jalalabad during the planning of the attack, he's now awaiting trial. Proudly a member of the Taliban, Ruhala says no one encouraged him to do this. Look at our situation. The foreigners kill our people, they insult our religion, burning the Holy Quran and making cartoons of our Prophet Muhammad. If we don't defend Islam, then we are not Muslim. Suicide bombings and other attacks. I'm just going to fast forward this. I want you to interview, listen to him more than anything else. 
has a four-year-old son who he says he loves and misses very much. When I ask him how he'd feel if his child was used as a suicide bomber, he tells me if he wants to be a suicide bomber when he gets older, well then no one can stop him. If he follows Islam and does it for Islam, then that's a good thing. At times he speaks with hatred in his eyes, and then there are moments when he smiles, explaining this is all a test from God. Our real life starts after doomsday, so this is not our real life. This world is a paradise for pagans and a hell for Muslims. We just need to be patient. The Afghan intelligence service... Right, so I'm just, I know we, when we watch TV, we all get into it quite often, we don't want to leave it, but just wanted to show you so you can see what it's like. Listen to the thinking that he has, what his perception is of the world itself and how he thinks about that. I also want you to watch the mixed emotions that he has that's there. One, it's the anger that he has, right? And the other one is a sense of peacefulness that's there. As I go through this process, how did he get to that point? As I go through this process, what I'm going to emphasize is that a lot of this has to do with emotional turmoil and changes people make within their emotions rather than cognitions. This is the process of terrorist mind development and how he changes his perception. One, these people experience a perceived unfairness. Something is going on in the world in which they feel is unfair. Two, there's a perceived option to fight unfairness. What can I do to fight this? And if you can't do anything to fight this, then what happens, you seek others. After you seek others, and they're around there, as they're around, these groups are there to help recruit you, get you into their organizations, where they then perform perceptual persuasion. The next step is one that gets you recruited. The next one they need to now convert you, get you into a full-blown 100% agreement and a commitment to their organization before they can get you out okay, on a mission of glory. So let's talk about first, the first part of this, which is perceived unfairness. Okay? Uh, poverty and a lack of education are problematic okay, in this first step, but not predictive. As I said before, that there are individuals that are very wealthy of education who still do this. So we still see this is an indication that's there. But there's got to be a perceived injustice and a feeling of frustration and shame. I can't do the things I want to do. What's going on in my life? I feel stuck. Not a lot of us do this. I feel stuck. I can't get ahead. I feel a perceived personal deprivation. It's me. I can't do anything. And then there's a fraternal deprivation which says the people around me, my society that's there, okay, the organizations I belong to, we can't reach this goal either. We can't do this. Okay? So what I want to do is, before we show this clip, let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, Dr. Storick gave me this uh, clip, some of the Serrano uh, clips from a movie okay, that's there that traces the development of individuals who start out just wonderful young men. They're working in another country to make money for their family. So this is what happens, and you can read this stuff. Basically, uh, Pakistani immigrants are going to work at a Connex refinery. Uh, they're making money. They're providing money. They're sending money back to the family. They have dreams of bringing their family there to be with them. Then all of a sudden, boom, they lose their job. Okay? It's gone. They don't have any more job. Their place was feeding them, it was providing them shelter as well, and they can't do that. So the son, Wasim, goes out and he tries to find work. I mean, he's frustrated, he's upset, but he, he says, no, I can do this. I can go out and find work. And he tries to get work in many different places, but he's told one reason that you can't do it is you don't teach, uh, talk, you don't speak Saudi, you have to learn that. Sorry, you can't get your job. So what winds up happening is that a lot of these young men and some of their fathers are living in the confines of a camp waiting to be de deported. But they just can't do anything else. They're bored, they're isolated. And let me show you the next section.
what's happening is that you're not thinking correctly, right? Because you're, you're thinking through your emotions down a bit. Those of you who've had a little too much to drink or too much to smoke or drink, there's too much ecstasy or whatever else, but if you're in that state of mind as well, you have rendered all logic and rationality that's there. So you're making your decisions based on all emotion that's there. Very easy to manipulate and persuade people who are so lost in all those emotions, all those drug states. What happens now is here he is and anybody else, if they can't answer that question and say, yes, I do have an opportunity, I just need to work harder and on and on and go to school, if that's not there, then what happens in time of stress, we affiliate. In time of stress, we affiliate. If you remember 9-11, where you were at that time, what happened, most people got together with other people. Churches, the attendance in churches were skyrocketing. People got together in malls and schools to talk about what was going on. In times of distress, we affiliate. What happens when we affiliate? It gives us great solace and comfort in knowing that you're not alone. I'm not the only one that's feeling it. I'm going to be with people who have the same values that you're one of us. We're doing this together. I highlighted in bold the emotional changes. Psychological and emotional connections are met. Okay? That's very important as humans because we all want to make contact with others. So now I can be with those other people. Great empathy is given and sympathy. Empathy, I know what you're feeling. I can be in your shoes. I can feel that. Sympathy, I'm sorry for what happened to you during that time. You lost your job. You got beat up. What winds up happening as you seek others, okay, there's going to the injustice will be blamed on a targeted group. None of us ever want to say, oh, it's all about me. I'm the one that screwed up. What we usually do is look for stereotypes. It's those people. Those people are going to do it. This process, this stage, can be done okay, in person with a group, or what series can be done on the internet. All you have to do is Look for same-minded people, and all that information comes down for you there. You make an emotional connection with a soon-to-be mentor as well. There usually now is going to be somebody who comes in and will be, now begin to talk with you about that. All right? Perceived unfairness. Fairness matters the most in this stage. I cannot achieve what the media presents of affluent and democratic lifestyles. Remember, our culture is spread throughout the world, right? We watch Miley Cyrus all over the place, okay? Okay, so people all over the world are going to say, I want that, I want that, I want to be like that. If I can't get that, then that increases my anger, my frustration, that's it. Reactions to perceive unfair treatment, lack of empowerment, feelings of helplessness, feelings of hopelessness, anger, and I'm going to blame others. Okay. So the second one, Wasim and his friends now are going to seek others. They're doing this not to change their views, but really for food. And maybe some additional study to help them get this. سيحاولون طمس الاختلاف حتى يجعلوا المسلمين الذين يتحدثون في الدين يبدون كمتعصبين او متخلفين سيقولوا لنا ان الخلاف هو خلاف على الموارد الاقتصاديه او الهيمنه العسكريه ولو صدقنا ذلك سوف نفتح لعبه في ايدينا وعندها لا نلومن الا انفسنا ولا يمكن ابدا سرد الفرق بين الطبيعه البشريه والحياه الحديثه عن طريق التجاره الحره لا يمكن الدين والدوله الدين والدوله ما لهمش غير مفهوم واحد القران ولا يمكن ان نفصل بين الدين والدوله لا يمكن القران مش على طريقة الملوك والعبيد، لا. القرآن. الأمر 
الحياه العصريه لا تعالج بالغاء قوانين او الفصفصه او الانفتاح او خفض الدراهم ولا يمكن ان نقضي على الام العيش في العالم الحديث عن طريق المجتمع الليبرالي لا يمكن والدليل على ذلك سقوط المجتمعات الليبرالية سقوط اللاخوت المسيحي سقوط الغرب و في نسيت ده سكونا بطل الباسيتي Ou a princípio das coisas a fazer um passo de tempo, ou a princípio de ser físico na cidade, tudo se tem. 
لیکن یہ بھی نہیں سمجھا تو مکھرا آتا ہے نا ہم انسان کی گناہ کا نشان ہوتا ہے جیسے مکھرے نے پیچھے پا کر کے انہوں نے کھڑ کاٹ کر اس کو آدھے دن دیر میں جا دیا تو آدھے روشنی میں وہ اسلیم ہوتا ہے پہلی پکڑتا ہے پھر دارو آتا ہے اور بے سود کر کے آپ اس کو آتا ہے ایک دن تک مرتا ہوا ہے
and something called confirmation bias. Social conformity is a type of social influence involving a change in belief or behavior in order to fit in with a group. We conform. We want to do what other people do. I know when I teach this in my class, I always say, I know no one here conforms, but we all do. Okay? We all want to be like others, and there's a certain tendency okay, that we move in that direction. These people use that. They have what we call students or people who are in the group, and everybody else thinks, oh, you're one of us just going through this, but they're not. Okay? They're part of the program, and when the leader says X, they go, yeah, that's it. And it spreads to the group that people pick up on that. They also use social obedience. Obedience is a form of social influence. I'm the leader. I'm the most important person here. I'm the authority. Most of you will obey. Okay? Most of you will obey. Okay? So what winds up happening, you're looking up to this fellow who we just saw. He's a good guy. He's taking care of us. He's providing food for us. They're giving us all this different information. I'm developing hopefulness. I'm no longer helpless anymore. So I'm probably going to enthusiastically identify with the groups that you were in. This is part of the difference that's here. Okay? The people who are enthusiastic about this and really buy into this, those are the ones we watch out for. Confirmation bias is a tendency for people to favor information that confirms their preconceptions. The label become, becomes truth regardless of reality. That high school jock I was talking about, he's a jock, he's not real bright. Well, he's in what, second semester of calculus, okay? he's done real well, but then all of a sudden he flubs up in class and says some silly answer that's there, and the rest of the people in class go, that can't do much. You know what it takes, confirmation bias? If people label you, if you just do something wrong once, just once, what happens is that automatically the bias comes back, right? Are you talking about Obama? Um, right? Confirmation bias? What is he? He's a socialist, isn't he? Let me tell you why he's a socialist, right? And he, he may only do one thing that indicates that, okay? but then confirmation bias kicks in and says C is for what well, you're for Obama, okay? And what happens is that you say, well, if you people are against Obama, then you people must be what? You're against it. You must be a racist. You don't like my people. That's what it is. That's what it is. And anything you say and do is confirmed that way. Okay? Confirmation bias. And it doesn't take much for you to bring this on. Back to Maslow. That's here. Next step up is esteem. What am I going to do that's going to be important in my life? What can I do that's important in my life? Something that's meaningful for me. Something that makes me feel good about my life. Or you can be part of this group. And how do you be part of this group? Well, you might have a mission to do as well. Right? Find out what someone's need is. Figure out the need. Give them that sense of motivation. Make them feel proud of themselves. Commitment to the organization. We want you to reduce inventory mechanisms, which basically means not none of us really want to harm other people. We don't want to hurt other people. <coughs> But what we're going to do within the group to get you to change your mind is we're going to work on that and we're going to go through different exercises so that you will stab somebody and hurt somebody. What we'll do is we'll take out uh, Uncle Sam, we'll picture him there. What we'll do, we'll all stab him with knives that are there. Okay? We'll go through some type of condition responses to get you to reduce the inhibitory mechanism. We'll have you play video games and blow things up watch blood go all over the place. That's okay, because we'll do it again and again and again to reduce your basic inhibitions. We're going to use more social categorization. We're going to talk a lot about those people. And by the way, if civilians get in the way, it's justified. If you're going to kill innocent children and other people, I'm sorry that happens. We call that collateral damage. That's there, but it's okay to do that. And you tell people over and over and over again. We're going to develop what's called emotional anchors. There's going to be something that every time I say to you, whatever it may be, okay, Satan, every time I say Satan, automatically you're going to feel a great sense of pride and the ability that you want to harm somebody else. So now let's do that together. 
how can it say, chanted, it say, say, you have to say, you have to do us, because it screams and yells, and then you stab somebody. And right away, that's there. You're constantly trying to be programming people. And by the way, when you're in this organization now, you have absolutely no opportunity to leave a lot. Okay? You're in the organization, period. And if you question the organization, let's see if we can reduce your inventory mechanism. Because if you challenge us right now, well, then you're the one who may get killed. So let's see if Asim can go, and if he really is one of us, and this guy over here is saying no and doesn't want to do this anymore, oh, Asim has a gun. Shoot him. Let's see if you can do it. Shoot him. Let's have everybody else watch. If Asim can't do it, then somebody else will. Boom. And they'll kill somebody right before you. Or they'll use a little Hollywood that's there. They'll have a gun that shoots blanks. And have blood shoot all over the place, and just to show you that you can do this, and this is the appropriate thing to do. Changing your perception, changing your perception. What does this all lead to at this point? It's an incredible sense of righteousness. Right? Ah, we are right in what we're doing. Righteousness, a feeling, a way of life that's all about doing the right thing. It's a distorted perception at this point that's there. I'm going to stop for a second. I know I'm running out of time. Just give me five to seven more minutes, all right? Does the process of terrorist, pay out the word terrorist, perceptual conversion happen in other groups? Do other groups in the United States change your perception about things? Can they? Think about it. Does the percept process of perceptual conversion happen in other groups? Does it happen in cults? Yes. What about the military? Those of you who've been in the military, you have similar type of training. Social groups that you're in. Remember when you were in high school? And high school had the, the druggies and they had uh, the goths and all these different groups. You get into those groups, how did they change you? How did your perceptions change? Sports. Okay, now we're not killing anybody, although somebody in LA, a Dodger fan, did kill a Johnny fan this summer. Organized religion. They sway you that way. Politics, abusive relationships, dysfunctional families, all of the above. Can it happen in other areas? Okay. And you say yes, it can happen. I'm glad you're thinking with me, right? Factors leading to action. When I study this, this is the part I don't understand that well. How can you tie some bombs around you? How can you go kill innocent people? But it does happen. It happens, by the way, pretty easily. Modern weaponry decreases personal contact. If I see that I'm hurting you, sometimes that will increase the me that mechanism so that I don't want to hurt you. But modern mechanism doesn't do that. I'll send a drone in and then go have a subway. Boom, people are, are, are gone for it. The Boston Marathon people, how cocky they were when they were walking around setting off those bombs down there. They don't see anything I'm okay. Psychological distancing uses terrorist myths to provide a spark to get people to recognize their actions. Victims are not aware of the attack, so you don't see people getting hurt, so you can keep doing it. And there's always a contact person. There's somebody when these people are out on their mission that they report to. And the contact person uses some type of an anchor to remind you that's it. Could be an icon, a picture. I want you to visualize what this is like, or some type of emotional feeling. Feel that anger, that hatred that you have. Emotional context. Once they get to this level, anger becomes hatred. Anger becomes hatred. And the hatred is blinding, and it leads to revenge, right? Never ending revenge. Your people killed my people in the year 1215, so we're going to exterminate you people. Okay? Over and over and over again. So all of these emotions that begin to build up. Okay? So what happens at this stage? Now, Maslow's probably rolling over in his grave when I talk about this, because it's not agreeing with this one. I need a self actualization that's the, that need that's there. What is it? Well, my life has meaning. There's a real goodness in what I'm doing. There's a real perfection in what, what I'm doing. Okay? What I'm doing is right. I tie the bombs onto me. I 
He'll blow something up. I am absolutely right in doing this. And what winds up happening, and I can show you that, what winds up happening is that when these people do that, they're not nervous, they're not usually uptight, they have a sense of peacefulness. And that was the clerk that was going to show you the clerk that for that. You're feeling good about this because they're hopeful because they're going on to support themselves. The process of ideological, ideological development is it's not right, right? Your experience, this is not right, what's going on in my life? It's not fair, it's your fault, those people, those people are evil. It all comes from David Warren's work. And the last thing I added was, let's go get those people. Perceptions. It's all about perceptions, isn't it? And sometimes you can see things and sometimes you can't see things. You see what? A young woman who has her head like that, right? There's another picture in there. Can you see the second picture of an older woman? Kind of hard though, isn't it? Sometimes our perceptions get so locked in they never change. Okay, this is her ear, this is going to be her jawline, this is going to be her mouth, and excuse me, this is her nose, this is her mouth, and this is going to be her jawline. Sometimes we get locked in, we can't change our perception whatsoever. Can't see it, can you? That's okay, that was my point. Real quickly, what can be done to deter terrorists? Short-term policies, you can see that list of that, that's there, to defend our country, right? But the long-term policies are probably more important. Reduction of inequality in the world. Equal participation. Awareness education for people about how absolutely overwhelming us versus them mentality is. We want to promote justice and interobjectivity, which is understanding shared information within culture so we can understand each other. One more thing, okay, for you people, before you go, I'm going to get restless. Salient elements to eliminate perceptual, perceptual persuasion. How can you stay out of bad relationships, abusive relationships? You don't want to get caught in a cult. You don't want to get caught like these people do. How do you do this? One, stay educated, right? I'm educating you now, right? Stay aware of yourself and your own emotions that you have, what the feelings that you have. When you do have all of these emotions, emote and then release those emotions so you can think clearly. You always want to maintain hope, okay? At the bottom of your deepest levels, if something works out, something can work out for you. You've got to have hope. But hope doesn't do that enough. Yeah, you also need to motivate yourself to work for you and do different things to get yourself out. And above all, think critically. Right? Don't let your emotions take on you. What are these people trying to do? Is my friend in an abusive relationship? Okay? Am I being attracted to a cult? What's this going on in my life? Think critically about this. Ah. All right.